Well, I'm particularly excited to have Bob, because I know this is going to be an exciting talk. Why? Because I know every time Bob and I get together, we weave the conversation into many different areas of interest. But let me tell you a little bit about Bob to start with. Bob Metcalf was an internet pioneer starting in 1970 at MIT. Harvard and Stanford. He invented the Ethernet uh, in Xerox, uh, Xerox's Palo Alto Research Center in 1973 and founded 3Com Corporation in 1979. Ethernet became the industry standard packet, packet plumbing of the internet. Today, more than a billion Ethernet ports ship per year. If you count Wi-Fi, which Pop does, uh, within that, that large number. Various times at, um, at internet company 3Com in Silicon Valley from 1979 to 1990, where Bob was both chairman and the CEO, VP sales, marketing general manager of, uh, of software workstations hardware division. And he eventually left one of the loves of his life there in 1990 uh, when he went on to um, raise 3Com's venture capital fund starting in 1981. Uh, this went, the company went public in 1984, and it had a 5.7 billion, may I say B, billion dollar in revenue in, uh, by 1999, and in 2010 became a part of Hewlett Packard. Bob spends the 1990s as CEO and publisher and col columnist of InfoWorld and VP Technology at, at its billion dollar parent, IDG. Bob spent the 2000s as general partner of the billion dollar venture capital company Polaris Venture Partners, where he's now emeritus partner. In 2011, we were very fortunate to have Bob become the professor of innovation at the Cockrell School of Engineering here at the University of Texas at Austin. And during 2015 to 16, Bob will be also uh, distinguished, uh, distinguishing himself again as the MIT Visiting Innovation Fellow. His principal interest is in the startup ecosystem surrounding research universities. Bob is a member of the National Academy of Engineering, and in 2005, he received the National Medal of Technology for his leadership in the invention, standardization, and commercialization of the Ethernet. Bob says his mission is to help Austin, and now Boston, which we'll hear about, and that's B-A-U-S-T-I-N, uh, be a better Silicon Valley. Bob, welcome. Thank you. I want you to know I wrote that bio. <laughs> I never tire of hearing it. <laughs> so, so, Bob, tell us about your entrepreneurial background. Give us some history in your words, not in what you wrote. So my background is an answer to the question, can entrepreneurship be taught or are you born with it? And I was not born with it. My father was a, uh, never went to college and he was a technician, a test technician, and he, I just remember the last few years, he actually did start a company. It was called BAM Electronics. Bailey, Abramson, and Metcalf Electronics. And they repaired televisions, which was a new technology in the early 50s. And it was through his company that I, he came home one day and found me unconscious on the basement floor because I had found the high voltage line in the back <laughs> of one of his televisions. And I think it was on that day I committed myself to stay below five volts for the rest of my career. <laughs> So then, uh, but, but that, that company blew apart within a year for the standard reason, which is the founders all thought, each of them thought they were working harder than the other two. So the company just went boom. Anyway, so that wasn't really entrepreneurial background. But then I went to MIT, which MIT in the 60s was Silicon Valley. It was the place, the hot place where startups were. It was called Route 128, so I was immediately immersed in all that. So that, it was a, that immersion that led me I, uh, into entrepreneurship. I started three companies while an undergraduate, but they were consulting companies, paid tuition and, and um, so on. And then I then went to Silicon Valley, where once again it was in the water. So in 1979, I announced to my boss at Xerox that I would be leaving in seven months. I gave him seven months' notice. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> Why seven months notice, Bob? Well, I was in the middle of something, and I didn't want to leave him in the lurch. Okay. So we finished the project, and then I left to pursue entrepreneurial ambitions with no idea what those ambitions would be. So I didn't leave to start a company. That happened five months later. And, and how, between leaving and then coming up with the company you started, what happened 
Were you just searching for an idea? Did you have an idea before you left, but you hadn't really pursued it? Well, I'd been involved with Ethernet for eight years. Right. Uh, and the internet was just beginning. It wasn't call, even called the internet then, but it was getting started. And I had a hunch it was going to catch on. And the, um, uh, so I started consulting. So the day I left Xerox in January of 79, I started consulting. I got an apartment in Palo Alto and in Boston. I used to commute one week, one week consulting. All my friends worked for the airlines after a while. <laughs> and then uh, in February, uh, Gordon Bell, who was then the vice president of engineering of the world's second largest computer company, not Dell, it was called um, Digital Equipment Corporation, asked me to invent a network for DEC. Mm -hmm. And I said I couldn't possibly do that because I felt loyal to Xerox, where I had worked for eight years. And second of all, I had already designed the best possible network I could think of, so his wouldn't be as good as the one I had done for Xerox. So, so in that meeting, we had the idea of approaching Xerox to cooperate with DEC to do a network together, and then we found Intel Corporation to provide chips and then I started 3Com to, I had a hunch that those three companies were about to make a standard and that my company should serve that standard. So that's how 3Com got started. Fabulous. Well, you were dealing with some phenomenal entrepreneurs then. I mean, Bob Noyce, Bell. Well, in June of 79, three days after founding 3Com on June 4th, my phone rang. It was the middle of the night. I was alone in this apartment in, uh, on um, Beaver Place in Boston. And by the way, the phone was hooked to the wall. It was a, a wire. And I was, my desk was the dining room table. And I remember the long line running over to the wall over there. And I had a typewriter as my principal tool. And the phone rang. And there was a guy named Steve from a company in Cupertino called Apple. And he, he uh, had heard I was a networking guru. And he wanted to talk to me about joining Apple to network. But I just started 3Com. So I begrudgingly agreed to meet him. And we met on Stevens Creek Boulevard at a hippie organic food restaurant. And he pitched me on this company called Apple. And then I, being a, a proto-marketing person, I pitched him on a product called Orchard. <laughs> <laughs> a network for the then Apple IIs, which was a pitiful PC, so it was really hard to network. So Steve didn't buy the orchard, and, but he didn't get mad at me either, and he helped me start my company. That's so he introduced, first introduction, I don't know why he thought this way, but his first introduction to it was to a man who did his advertising and public relations on Hamilton Avenue in Palo Alto. No, no, Lytton. And a guy named Regis McKenna. And Steve wanted me to meet Regis McKenna. So of all the things I needed, Steve thought I needed a marketing and PR guy to help me. And I go in the office, and on the, on the wall, leaning against the wall, was this a rainbow apple with a bite taken out of it, which Regis had just finished developing for Steve. It was pretty exciting. So anyway, uh, because Steve asked him to, Regis McKenna became my marketing for free. He was a phenomenal guy of his, of his day. Actually, he still is. He still is. Yeah, but, but I mean, he was the guy. So Steve gave him to me, and it was very handy. And then he introduced me to Bob Noyce, the founder of Intel, yeah. who became my investor. So I owe it all to Steve. And anyone who doesn't like Steve, you see me outside after. <laughs> <laughs> so. Oh, by the way, so Steve uh, came to our wedding in 1980 in Woodside, California at the little uh, white Presbyterian church there. Right? Let, me, let me make this clear. Not our wedding. <laughs> Bob and his wife Robin's wedding. <laughs> Just to clarify. I was clear on that. <laughs> <laughs> you know what the trouble is with having Steve Jobs come to your wedding? No one who went to that wedding remembers anything about it except that Steve Jobs was there. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Tell us more about the growth of, of, of 3Com and um, experience that you had during that growth phase that, that were new learnings for you? So we started as a consulting company, mm -hmm. so we were immediately profitable, and the personal computer industry was not quite here, and the internet was certainly not here, but those were our areas of expertise, so we consulted on that. And then we got a big client called Exxon, who had a company called Exxon Office Systems, and they paid us $750,000 to develop four products for them, and then to give them a fully paid worldwide perpetual license for those four products, which we did. Right. 
The 750 was non-dilutive. So then, we turn, then I turned to the venture community and said, I'd like to start marketing these four products. Uh, I need some venture capital. So we, we went up. I, I failed to mention, I lived on a road called Sand Hill Road. <laughs> and we're, my wife, Robin, also lived on Sand Hill Road. We met there. We started 3Com at, on Sand Hill Road. And then I turned to Sand Hill Road to raise venture capital. And they were right there. Um, they said, you idiot, you just licensed your four products to the world's largest company. Why should we invest in that? And I said, Exxon is an oil company. They will never bring these products to market. And they didn't. They didn't. And uh, we did. That's phenomenal. Um, 3Com went through exponential growth. Um, you know, it's hard enough to, to, to run a small company. It's amazing to run a company that scales, but one that has such exceptional growth. What was your biggest challenge in that growth curve for, for 3Com? I mean, we, we talked about in your bio that uh, by 1999, 3Com was uh, 5.7 5 billion. billion. Yeah, but in 99, it was easy to do $5.7 billion, because <laughs> the bubble <laughs> burst right after that. Uh, Excuse me, who's done the 5.7 billion here? It's so easy. <laughs> so, the, so there's a metaphor that embodies the principal lesson, which is big companies, the people grow more rapidly than the company. So you promote people, and they get raises and stuff. But with a high performance, rapidly growing Silicon Valley-ish company, the company is growing faster than the people. So you have to be careful about that. So, the, so that was the hardest thing. I started the company, you know, when you're starting a company, no one believes it's going to be successful, so you can't get, it's hard to get people to join. So all of my fraternity brothers and all of my ex-girlfriends worked for the company. <laughs> um. And then the company outgrew them. So we had, and the metaphor I use is a gear shifting. They, uh, you know, the people in various positions redlined. It was time to shift. And the best example of that was me. I was the, became... I'm skipping an ugly story here, but I became uh, vice president of sales and marketing at my company. And I got us from zero to a million dollars a month. And then I redlined. So then they kicked me out of the job and we put Mike Caliburka in and he took us from a million to five million and then he redlined. And then we went into third gear with Chuck Kempton and he, he took us from five to 25 million a month and then, and it was, and then he redlined and he stormed out the door. Um, and then came Bob Finocchio who took us you know, to billions. And so that those people all succeeded and they redlined and we had to shift them out, including me. And I think that's a really important lesson to learn and, and I love the metaphor. That's fabulous. When you were growing 3Com as part of the team, did you use any of the uh, Dorio Ecology that came out of Harvard. Dorio William is very famous, often referred to as the first venture capitalist. Um, well, I didn't know about Dorio then, but I knew very well his, I'm the one who called this system the Dorio system, so he, if he were here, he might not agree to this. But anyway, the whole notion of uh, research university, venture capitalists, um, the Silicon Valley model I call the Dorio ecology. And so I, I didn't call it that then, but we were in the middle of it. So we had venture capitalists, we had professors, we had uh, research contracts and patents and scaling entrepreneurs. So when it came time for me to not be CEO of the company, we had one, but Bill Krauss, he came from HP. He had run a 500 person division at HP for 14 years. He'd been a sales and marketing executive. Mm -hmm. and. I convinced him to become our president of our company. He grew us from 12 people to 12,000 people. Wow. That would be success, yeah. I think. And then he redlined, by the way. He redlined at 12,000 people. And I, I remember that I was chairman of the board still, and we, um, we made him chairman, mm -hmm. kicking him upstairs. And then we recruited our next CEO, who turned out to be Eric. Bob, do you believe that occasionally a person comes along who won't redline at a certain stage and is able to transform Oh, yeah. Their well, there are counterexamples right. all over the place. Okay. Ken Olson was the uh, founder of digital and wrote it up to yeah. $20 billion a year. He then got the cover. This is a sad story, actually. He got a, 
Ken Olson got the cover of Fortune magazine as Entrepreneur of the Century. And on that day, his board of directors should have retired him. Because then he continued on and he wrote his company right down. Until it was eventually purchased by Compaq. Yeah, so he owned his, he, he made the mistake of having a board of uh, uh, people who admired him and wouldn't even think of firing him. So what was your board like? Um, well, it grew. I'm very proud of the board. I built the board. It was mm -hmm. my, one of my accomplishments. And it began, well, it began with me being the only board member, which is uh, relaxing. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then we got... The uh, reporting was really easy then. Yes? I got to set the agenda. <laughs> the, the minutes were easy. I was also the audit committee. <laughs> and, the, and then uh, put uh, my fraternity brother, Howard, who is also a lawyer, uh, he was on the board as corporate counsel. And then there was um, Paul Barron, a famous inventor who basically invented the internet. He was on the board too. But then came the venture capitalists. And I tricked them. And I want to share this trick with you because it worked. Uh, we, had, we were raising money and uh, the term sheet, in those days the term sheet was actually a piece of paper that you wrote on with a pencil. And there was no Latin on it. It was just and they kept wanting me to write board seat. And I kept rate, putting a line through it, no board seat. And we'd argue about this. And I'm talking about the best venture capitalists in the world. Dick Cramluck of NEA, a guy named Wally Davis from Mayfield Fund, and then the angel group with Bob Noyce and the founder of Intel and John Young, the CEO of HP, and. Ken Oshman, the CEO, founder of Rome Corporation, they were all in this angel group. And I'm arguing about a board, board seat. seat. And uh, eventually they all capitulated and they agreed to terms without the board seat. But as I was leaving, this is where the trickery occurred. I turned to Dick Kramlick, the founder of NEA, which is a substantial VC firm, and I said, Dick, by the way, if I asked you to serve on my board, would you? You? He said, well, and he had just finished arguing with me for a half hour about not having a board seat. So he agreed. <laughs> and then uh, Wally Davis agreed. And um, uh, who was it? Oh, uh, Jack Melkor, who ran the Angel Group. And then I invited all three of them onto the board. So I had on my board, I'm about to say something insulting to MBAs. I had on my board the three leading, three of the leading VCs in Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. because my fear was they would, if they had a board seat, they wouldn't, be, they wouldn't take the board seat. They would put one of their fresh MBAs on it and make my company into a class project, which is not something I wanted. <laughs> so uh, I had these great VCs, they, and they did everything VCs are supposed to do. They helped the company. They gave us money. They gave us advice, and it, it all worked out. So I'm a big fan of VCs. You eventually moved to the VC side yourself. Uh, in the 2000s, you, uh, you were a general partner with Polaris. Yep, I became a, first a venture partner for a year and then a general partner for 10 years, and now I'm an emeritus partner, which means I have one more board to go. I'm on one, one remaining board, a solar wafer company, if any of you would be interested in such a thing. <laughs> Everything's for sale. Now, tell us more about Polaris, though. Tell, if you would, share a, you know, there's a big transition from operating a company to now finding companies and helping them and investing and doing exactly what Dick Ramlick and the other guys did for you. So you just touched on one of my big mistakes, which is I joined Polaris 2001. I had been a journalist for 10 years before becoming a VC yes. for 10 years. And, the, and I joined a VC firm. I could have started my own VC firm, but I don't, didn't know how to do that. So I just joined one full of very experienced people now running about four billion dollars in seven, six or seven funds. And these, my partners knew how to run a VC firm, so I joined it. But I joined with the following conceit that since I had started a company and grew it, I could help people with their startups. And so I foolishly uh, put more time into helping than choosing. So a VC can split their time between due diligence and choosing companies or helping them. And I started out being a helper and I went on all boards. I became CEO of a couple of companies. By the way, when I become CEO of a venture capital company, you know it's in trouble. I did that twice in my 10 years. Mm -hmm. So the lesson is, the lesson for me anyway, was uh, get over this conceit about how helpful you're gonna be and put all your energy into choosing 
your venture investments rather than helping them. Because it's very hard to help a, a broken company. Everyone thinks VCs have perfect sight in picking the perfect deal. And Nobody we know that, that we, we, we don't. We don't. <laughs> we don't, no. But, but would you share with us a company that you think, whether we know the name or not, went exceptionally well? And perhaps something that during that uh, looking at those deals, because you spent more time on the operation side, perhaps something uh, uh, was missed that you later thought you would have liked to have spent more So time. exceptional is hard these days, because there's all these, uh, what do they call them, unicorns, unicorns around. And I didn't have any unicorns. So well, you were a unicorn at 3Com in 3Com was a unicorn. Yeah. Billion dollar valuation. Yeah. Although it didn't do it in three days. It did it in 13 years. Right. Which is quite different. But so, so fast. So the, a company particularly relevant to uh, uh, here and now is I was a uh, founding investor and chairman for 15 years of a company called um, Ember that makes Zigbee radio chips for the what has become to be known as the Internet of Things. In fact, our founder called it the Internet of Things 15 years ago, so it was quite. And uh, we sold it to um, eventually to Silicon Labs, which mm -hmm. is a company around here. Mm -hmm. Some people think that we sold it to Silicon Labs because I moved here to Austin, but I had nothing to do with selling the company to Silicon It just appeared one day out my window. There was Ember. <laughs> So that was a, a fairly successful yeah, company yeah. because the Internet of Things is taking off. Yeah. We, uh, we uh, did a battery company which we sold and the odd thing about that is the buyer of the battery company refused, made the board members all sign an agreement they would not disclose the buyer of the company. So I presented a check for $75 million to my partners and I said I'm not going to tell you where it came from. <laughs> <laughs> But you're my partner. Uh, yeah, but I've signed this agreement. So. Right. Interesting experience. Any particular one, a company that you may have seen in its early days that went on to, to do great things that you look back at? And say? Well, I was not exactly a venture capitalist when this Google thing came along. I was a happy user of a software product called Alta Vista. <laughs> and, and then these other guys wanted to do a search engine too. I remember saying, well, I already have Alta Vista. <laughs> and, then, um, and then one day I switched. <laughs> <laughs> for a very obvious reason, you probably heard this story a lot, Alta Vista had a model for revenue that caused it to put ads on the page. So when you went to the, do a search, you had to, w and the modems ran at 50 kilobits per second if you were lucky. So it took forever to render those Alta Vista pages, whereas you went to Google, no ads, you just type your search, and eventually you got tired of waiting for all that rendering to go on, and we just, that's how Google succeeded. This is great. Bob, let, uh, let's move on, if we may, to your concept of Boston, B-A-U-S-T-I-N, a better Boston, a better Silicon Valley. Talk to us about that thought that you've uh, uh, been telling people about. So uh, the goals are um, freedom and prosperity, which is a virtuous circle. Mm -hmm. And the thing that drives the circle is innovation. Mm -hmm. There are many kinds of innovation, but the kind I'm enamored of is technological at scale. Mm -hmm. And that leads, especially from the internet experience, to uh, startups out of research universities. So that's the focus. There's many other variations, yeah, but yeah. That, that's the focus. And um, so here we are in Austin, and we have a research university. We have several of them, actually. Yeah. College Station is not that far from here. Um, yeah. I'm allowed to count them, aren't I? Sure. I've been told I'm supposed to ho hate Oklahoma, not uh, A&M. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so I say it is my mission to help make uh, Austin a better Silicon Valley. And that's not well received everywhere because there's a bunch of people in Austin who wear t-shirts that say keep Austin weird and they don't want to be like Silicon Valley. And they complain. We don't want to be like Silicon Valley. We don't want to compete with them. And um, I'm sorry. Uh, my favorite comeback is uh, Austin, you do not want to enter a weird contest with San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> Which is proof you can be as weird as you want and still be innovative. 
So let's keep Austin weird. I prefer keep Austin wired, which you've heard before, but it's a slight variation. Um, so tell us more about the freedom of, and prosperity that, that you're talking about in terms of a better Austin. Well, freedom, that's way up here, freedom and prosperity, which I uh, hold dear. And the, uh, so I, pros I spent 23 years in Silicon Valley and prospered. And we prospered because of this freedom we had to start companies and sell products and, mm -hmm. and it was the Wild West for a while. Oh, today's Silicon Valley and 1980's Silicon Valley are not the same place. So when I say a better Silicon Valley, I'm actually thinking the 80's, not the 15's. Right. Um, and in the 1980's, what was some outstanding attributes to you that made the valley unique? Well, there are all these characters around. Um, cowboys. Uh, no, we have a, cowboys. We have cowboys. We no, have cowboys. I have to use a different term. But like Al Shugart was one of my heroes. Right. And he would say, <laughs> they had him at a conference and they said, Al, what's your policy on sick leave? And Al said, Get sick, you should go home, get better. Get sick too much, you're fired. <laughs> <laughs> that became one of our principles. Uh, so the, there's a certain um, gritty, hard edge about the valley, which is, I think, necessary to um, uh, innovate. Mm -hmm. I wrote a, a paper once called, Invention is a Flower, Innovation is a Weed. And that was an expression of what happens to you when you try to innovate. Everyone loves innovation until you try to innovate on them. And then they hate it and it, they become the status quo. And so you need to, it's a, there's a certain gritty hard edge that the Valley has that's necessary for dealing with this status quo thing. Mm -hmm. And 3Com had this problem. We were peddling the internet and we were peddling um, the ethernet for connecting personal computers in a building at a time when there were no personal computers in a building. And the status quo was uh, very strong. So we, we set out to make Ethernet a standard, and IBM and General Motors decided that our standard wasn't good, and they had their own. So for, well, welcome to your, your startup has IBM and General Motors as your competitors. And, and uh, so we knocked General Motors. That was before they went bankrupt. <laughs> uh, I kept telling General Motors, you make cars, I will make the networks. What do you right. say? But no, they, they thought they were going to make the networks and failed quickly. Gen IBM, however, did not fail quickly. And their token bus, token ring was a uh, competitor of ours. And it came out of Texas, too. Mm -hmm. Texas Instruments did the token ring chips for IBM. Yeah. And I had to buy those chips. Because my company had, my board, my adult supervision, my carefully constructed board of directors, said, you cannot risk your company on your invention. You need to be diversified. So we, we shipped the IBM token ring ahead of IBM. Wow. Uh, we didn't sell much of it, though. And that's even with people like Bob Noyce, the founder of Intel, on your board. And was he still there then? Yeah, he was never on our board. Oh, uh, just an investor. He was an investor. Just, yeah. I say just an but investor. But he called. Important uh, investor. He called now and then. But no, the board was probably right to suggest that we were a connectivity company and it would need, and in those days we assumed IBM would win. Yeah. So you go to work every day where everyone around you thinks you're going to lose. It, it's very hard. Yes, it is. But I'd like to start opening this up to the audience. So if you have a question, would you please, um, I know it may be challenging, but would you either go to a mic or can someone pass the mic back to you? Um, while I ask another question. So don't be shy. We're not. Okay? Oh, do we have a question? Oh, you're Maybe past the mark. Thank you. Thank you. So, so um, you know, back in the, in the Silicon Valley in the 80s, you had some phenomenal people. You've talked about many of them today. I personally was lucky, to, lucky enough to know Bob Noyce and some of the people you talked about. There seemed to me like a high concentration of individuals who had come out of places like Stanford, like Noyce had come uh, from. Um, I'm sorry, Noyce was an MIT uh, graduate. But he, he had also worked at the, um, I'm trying to think of the name of the lab at Stanford. There was Stop nine of him. Sorry? 
Stanford. Thank you, Chuck Lee. That's but why not I Stanford. He was an MIT guy. Come on. Uh, I think you're just biased. And then he came to Austin. Didn't he come to Austin? And he run? actually came to Austin when he opened up Symmetech. Yeah. But you had people who were deep into their research at a research university, going back to that subject, who had taken it upon themselves for whatever reason to leave that you, that environment and start business. Um, do you think that environment was richer in the, the concentration of those type of people there at the time in the 80s? Or, and how does that compare with Austin today, do you think? So there's a scale. Uh, so Austin is uh, 20, 30 years behind Silicon Valley in terms mm -hmm. of history. So, mm -hmm. And the scale of it is you know, a tenth or, a, mm -hmm. or worse, 50th. The mm -hmm. scale is completely different. Right. So, so the Valley's been at it for a very long time. And it came f from Stanford. Stan By the way, uh, you see I'm wearing an MIT ring. So I'm an MIT graduate. And, and uh, I was just there. And I, I went to a lecture where they, they named two major um, spin-outs from MIT. Mm -hmm. Stanford and IBM. Oh, ooh. <laughs> I'm sure Stanford loved that. <laughs> Well, Terman was a MIT so, guy, went out and he, right. he uh, you know, created the industrial park there, right. and arguably um, created mm -hmm. Silicon Valley. I forget what question I was answering. Let me ask you a different question. <laughs> the question is, what should we do here in Austin to make the ecosystem better than well, it is today, to achieve your goal of more of these kinds of... Well, we're doing it. We're, mm -hmm. you know, the place is booming. It's really mm -hmm. fun to be here. Mm -hmm. And especially if you're in the startup business, it's a very exciting time. Right. And you, you, know, you can't listen to Boston, you know, Boston and New York and Los Angeles. They're all, they're, cities are huge, and so right. they lord this scale thing over us. Mm -hmm. uh, but they, uh, so here's some of the arguments we have. Do we have enough money? I think you got a direct response. <laughs> well, I'm on the other side. I think we have all the money we need. We just need better startups. Oh, okay. But that's, I'm, 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 that argument has not been resolved. But it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's <laughs> and there's a study about to come out from uh, Dave Alt David Altunian. Yes. He studied this, and he, has, uh, he agrees with whoever yelled out uh, no. Uh, he's discovered we have much less uh, venture capital activity than we should, mm -hmm. even, even for our size. Right. I, I'm on the other side thinking if we had better, I know that v VCs can fly and we have nonstop flights to London and New York and Boston and San Jose and Los Angeles. They can fly and the, and the VCs do fly and they do invest here, the ones from out of town. Mm -hmm. So that's h how I argue that we have all the money we need, we just need better startups. And mm -hmm. now I'm going to tell you what we need with startups. That I learned this at Polaris but now I've seen it here too. Much more money could be put to work if we had more qualified startup CEOs. Mm -hmm. And that's what Silicon Valley has over us. It has all these people who have been involved with startups for a long, long time. And if you need a CEO, they're there. Mm -hmm. And we need more of those. Do we need to attract them here, or do we need to grow them here, or both? I'm told there's a bunch of delionaires mm -hmm. who have retired. And we need to lure them off the shelf and bring them into our startups to, you know, to make their mistakes. Mm -hmm. and, the, um, and we do have some CEOs who have done a few companies, and we should cherish them and encourage them to keep doing it. Mm -hmm. And then we need to recruit them into the, into the city from outside. So the serial entrepreneur is a rarefied group that we need more, more of. Yes. Yes. I, in fact, I think that's the limiting factor. It's not the money. It's the... Because VCs are reluctant to give their money away unless they have some confidence that it's come, or even angels think this. In fact, everybody thinks this. I, I'm not going to give you money unless it's going to come back. Right. And so who am I going to give this money to? Uh, a passionate person who can't balance their checkbook or somebody who's gone public three times and knows how to run a company? Although, interestingly, we have in Austin the third most active angel network in the country for an association, the Central Texas Angel Network. Do you think by uh, seeding a lot of deals through angel investing that we'll eventually get those serial entrepreneurs? So when I first arrived in Austin, I got in a big argument with Josh Baer, who's uh, an active angel investor. 
And he in routinely insulted venture capitalists. And I w was a venture capitalist, so I took, took it personally. Right. So we would argue. And then he asked me how I funded 3Com, and I've already told you the story. The lead investor in my first round, I hadn't thought it was an angel Thank group. You. I just didn't know they were an angel group until Josh pointed it out to me. Bob Noyce. Yep. The, the sign was they invited me to uh, Jack's house on a Thursday, and there was Bob Noyce and John Young and all these CEOs. Of, and then at the end of my pitch, Jack asked who was in. Mm -hmm. And a couple of hands went up, and oh, that's an angel meeting. I didn't realize it. We didn't uh, Josh to, pointed yeah. this out. <laughs> so I, I had an angel funded company. So. Yeah, and then the we go this but way. then the lesson Josh is learning is that then the VCs came in behind them. Mm -hmm. So it's not good to go around pissing off the VCs if you're going to need them in an A round. Right. It's just not healthy. You know, they, they take offense. Mm -hmm. So you should be nice to yep. the VCs so that they're there when you, you need them. I'm very much in favor of that. Take, take Bob's comment to heart. Be nice to VCs. We have a question. Turned on here. Can you hear me? Yes. Great to have you here, and I want to thank uh, Laura for making this possible. Laura and I have the privilege of uh, serving together on a board of directors, University Federal Credit Union here in Austin. Um, I I'm have a customer uh, of your credit union. Are you? Well, well, I was counting on that. I was hoping so. Probably most of the people in the room here probably are. But uh, small tribute before I ask you a question. Back in the 80s, I tried to s teach myself how to set up an Ethernet network, and I had five or six computers all wired up beautifully. And uh, for four or five days I worked and I could not make the thing work. I finally asked an electrical engineering friend what, what was wrong and he said, are you using 3Com cards? And I said, no, brought the cheap Chinese ones. He said, well, that's your problem. I got your cards, plugged them in, the thing worked in about 10 minutes, ran for 10 years after that that I was affiliated with it. Thank you. So, so uh, that's th there's still a place in today's uh, computer uh, constellation, I think, for stuff that works as opposed to uh, cheap stuff that doesn't work. But anyway, I want to ask you about uh, being an entrepreneur. You have done it in so many different ways, and it seems to me you've started companies, but you've had the help of an awful lot of people along the way. And, you know, a lot of the kids, they come out of the business school and they think they want to start their own company. Maybe they've got an idea or maybe they're searching for an idea. Uh, talk to us a little bit about the, the relative merits of trying to go out on your own or perhaps maybe what you've done, trying to find established companies that will let you take on a role uh, that is somewhat entrepreneurial but with the backing of the established organization and the financial resources that they can offer. So I've noticed that there's a um, obsession with <coughs> founders and uh, you can't build a company with just the founder. So I've invented a word, founderati. <laughs> the founderati are the glamorous people involved in the, the growing and building of startups, the founderati. And uh, this is an important point for founders to get, because uh, a good sign that a founder is not getting it is if on his card it says, founder. Because you don't want to walk around your company. You're trying to build a team to grow a company, and you walk around telling everyone, I'm a founder, and you're not. It's just not a good attitude. So the founderati are part of the team. Now, but your question had more to do with, um, rather than creating your team, is joining an existing team. And th this is what I'm recommending. This is dangerous. We have, st uh, at UT, we have undergraduates who are dying to start companies. The problem is they don't know anything. Then we have professors who know a lot, and they're not inclined to start companies. So it's, I got to figure that out and get them to breed or something. <laughs> and the, uh, hold and on, this is a clean show. This is a clean show. <laughs> in the sense of breeder reactor. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. So the, so the students say, uh, uh, we all want to start companies. We want to be like Zuckerberg and Jobs and Gates and Dell and uh, Mackey and. Then I say, name five more, and that, that stops them. Because you have to work hard to get the second five. You have to work really hard. Most 
successful entrepreneurs are not 19 years old. Most of them, are. I was 33 when I started my company. And I was, I was a, a, a child prodigy at 33. Usually it's in the 40s when you start a successful company. But I think the statistics are 41 actually. Uh, so what should these undergraduates do? And what I'm currently recommending is um, that they get a job with a startup. So go work at a startup. Mm -hmm. And then the, uh, the last alternative is the one you were touching on, which had to do with go work for a big company, which is what I did. I went to Xerox. I got my PhD and then went to Xerox Corporation for eight years uh, to learn something, to put in those 10,000 hours that, uh, what was his name? Gladwell, Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours. I did that at Xerox. I mean, I, so then when it came time to start my company, I knew something, I knew stuff. I knew how to build Ethernets. So uh, think of, I think of large, big schools as grad, uh, big companies as grad, grad school, post-grad school. Post-grad school. Other questions, sir? Morgan? Yep. There we go. Um, so, similar to how uh, uh, Park City has Sundance and Las Vegas has CES and Davos has banking, um, Austin has South by Southwest. And how do you feel that when talking about an ecology, the fact that this one town is synced on the same sort of cycle pattern affects the ecology of you know, starting up and growing the town? South by Southwest is an enormous asset to our startup ecosystem here. Uh, tomorrow I'm going to Boston for Hub Week, first time called Hub Week. It is Boston's answer to South by Southwest. They, the designers of Hub Week said, hey, the South by Southwest thing's going on down there in Austin. We need one of those. So they're going to try next week and I'm going there. Do you think another place can replicate that type of industry focus? Well, not exactly, but yes. Uh, um, just think, it's a, it's a party. It's a, it's a huge networking opportunity. Yeah, everybody it's comes a, together. A place to draw people from out of town to see how nice things are here, uh, and it you know keeps us all weird. Right. As you know, we all want to be constantly. But to think of it like uh, seasonality. As far as everybody, if they're trying to develop their company or product, like that's the show that everybody's kind of yes, building trade towards. Shows drive progress in startups. Mm -hmm. So uh, we used to have a show called uh, Comdex every November. Miraculously, all products got finished in early November uh, because you had to show up at the big Comdex there. So that was a. So South by is kind of a, f a forcing function for a lot of companies, especially the social media ones that flourish in the South by environment. They get all their products and they, so now there's a, you can, uh, Hugh Forrest and uh, Chris Valentine who do the startup stuff at, at South by, they're now teaching a class on how, I t retweeted it yesterday, how to leverage your star, uh, South by Southwest with your startup. They're teaching you how to do it. Right, you're the network guy so you could plug all the Austin people into the Silicon Valley network when they come around. Austin, uh. yeah. well, just remember, no one goes to South By anymore because it's way too crowded. <laughs> <laughs> but it's been very, very successful. And very many, as you say, very many companies have started and done very, very well there. Of course, the classic Twitter uh, came out of... Name five more. <laughs> <laughs> I could, but I'd have to kill you afterwards because <laughs> they're still in growth mode. No, actually... Um, you know, there's been a number that have come up, especially in the early days of social media. Do you think we need another festival that's different than the, than the in interactive side of South By? No, I think all sorts of startups have an opportunity there, and just not, the, not just the social so, ones. Okay. I think so. Interesting. Other questions? There's, can someone pass the microphone? Oh, you have the microphone, and then can someone else pass that microphone to that gentleman who's p waving his hand? There's another microphone here. If someone could just take off it, thank you. So, Luke. Sure, Luke. yeah, yes. So, I really appreciate the gentleman's comment because that's the conundrum I face now. I'm getting my master's and the natural track is for me to go work for a Fortune 500 company. But at the same time, Bob knows that I have these other inclinations. Uh, and so you said earlier that early experience at a startup is 
important in you trusting whether or not a company is going to be successful. The CEO starting multiple companies is a good indicator. That's kind of probably self-explanatory, but is early experience at multiple startups either necessary or sufficient for being, being successful yourself? Or, or should you try to get experience with large companies before? People tend to teach what worked for them. What worked for me was working at Xerox Corporation for eight years. So I'm a big fan of um, uh, being part of the innovation system of a large company for a while. So you learn about markets and technologies and then, then maybe you know enough to start your own company. But when you're, um, what we recommend, uh, Josh and I, what we recommend to the students in the Longhorn Startup Program is uh, you probably should go work for a startup. Don't try to do your own. Now, if you're, gonna, if you're determined to do your own, we're not going to stop you. But if you're, you know, want some advice on placing bets, you probably should go work at a startup and figure out how that all works. And, and perhaps the good and bad of wherever you work. There's lessons to be learned in, in both directions, I would say, yeah. And none of it is statistically significant. So you may choose a startup and learn a bunch of the wrong things, or it may be horrible. So I only did one big successful company, uh, and yet I'm asked to opine about how to start companies. I don't have that much experience. I, it worked for me once. Um, Interesting. Sir, you had a question. And then can someone pass the microphone to the gentleman at the back, please? If, sir? This might seem a little greedy, but I've kind of got two questions. Um, is this on? We're not hearing. Can I have the other mic? Uh, the battery should be on that one. Is on? OK, just speak up just loud if you it. would. Talk right into it. Yes. OK, um, th this might seem a little greedy because I've got two different questions. One of them actually There's actually moving towards a lot of uh, Austin's events are moving towards becoming tech events. Like, there's already South by Southwest. I'm seeing a little bit of it at ACL. There's going to, next year there's going to be a um, gaming event called DreamHack coming to Austin, which is going to be very huge. It's going to be a very huge uh, gaming-centered event. There, you can bet your bottom dollar that all of the large tech companies in Austin or the surrounding areas are going to have private events for their uh, big money spenders. Do you think that there's going to be an oversaturation of events uh, like that? Or if, if they sync up that there's going to be tech events all year round, will that actually be good for the ecology? So there's no events coming to town? Like a gaming event um, soon? DreamHack. DreamHack, yes. It should be May next year. Okay, in May next year. So should we have more of these? Is there going to be too many of these events? What do you think? Well, it goes in cycles. Uh, mm -hmm. Successful conferences breed successful conferences, and then people overdo it. And there's too many of them. Or a bubble bursts. So Comdex, which I went to for 14 years in a row at in Las Vegas, one, it went from 200,000 people to zero the next year when the internet bubble burst. Mm -hmm. So they easy come, easy go. Uh, I love events. I think they're good for Austin if they come here. So they each have their life cycle. Dell, Dell World is here. That's another example. That's kind of what I was mentioning by the uh, companies having their own individual uh, events. So, uh, 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 what's Salesforce.com had its big conference in San Francisco. It's so big, in fact, that they had to put a cruise ship to, as a sort of an extra hotel. So I was talking to uh, Hugh Forrest, and I said, "Why don't we have a cruise ship on our waterfront?" <laughs> apparently, the dams get in the way. Uh, <laughs> we'll fix that. Problem. Don't worry. We'll fix that. Yeah, problem. cruise ship. Yeah, cruise ship. <laughs> but I. I they certainly bring new people to the area. They bring an ability for people to network and talk amongst themselves. And I think it's a, often a recognition of a core group of perhaps talent here, and certainly in the gaming area. Uh, 
next to the sample area. The they also address the communication problem within Austin. Yes. It's very common to go to an international conference, you know, 5,000 miles away and spend the whole time with a person who's down the street from you in Austin. Mm -hmm. It just creates an occasion for you to talk no matter where it is. Getting the people together is important. So at the back. And then if you would pass the microphone on to whoever else has their hand raised. Is this working? Yes. Yeah. So I don't know if I'm using the right terms, but back in the 70s and the 80s, startups were mo more focused on hardware development. And we've been going through a more of a software kind of site from startups, you know, Google, Facebook. Do you see where m might the next step be for startups? So you've got people starting their apps. Oh, that's the most popular business right now. Uh, what do you see that in the next 20 years, what the successful startups of today will be, will be doing? Right, so that division that you just made between hardware and software is, is it's not really a real division. My, my company, we sold Ethernet cards and servers and workstations, but two-thirds of our engineers were software engineers. So what we're, we were a networking company, I guess, rather than hardware and software. You've heard the Internet of Things, which everyone believes will make us more hardware-oriented than we've been the last few years, and that's, that's plausible. I don't think that's a really important distinction. Hardware and software, to me, are just fade into each other. Uh, and what really, I think what really makes the difference is the existence of a platform. So what we're enjoying now is a platform that developed. You know, anybody can develop a website now. Apparently, everybody is developing. <laughs> and, that, and that platform just unleashed a lot of investment and uh, successful investment. It wasn't so long ago the CMOS platform emerged. It made uh, application-specific uh, semiconductor ASICs, integrated circuits. Uh, it became easy to do ASICs. So there was a time not so long ago when everybody was a chip company for a while because of that platform. CMOS was just a, a fruitful platform to develop ASICs on. But I think the way to answer your question about the future is to, have, is to look for the platforms. This is what platforms are going to emerge. So the Internet of Things needs a, an ensemble of standards to create an Internet of Things platform. I haven't quite seen it yet, actually. But I know it's going to happen. But there's, some, there's going to be these emergent platforms that are going to just uh, create a similar um, burst of successful startups based on a platform of the Internet of Things. I can't tell you what that standard is going to be, though. That would be the multi-billion dollar. That would be the unicorn problem, if you could. Yeah, the platforms breed unicorns. Uh, you can get started. You know, all those years of building the Internet, all that, all those connected people is now easy to tap into a website. Other questions? So. Yeah, you talked about uh, So how do you handle how, how things? Do you, how, do you, how do you like gracefully make that transition without destroying the relationships? How do you handle things when your friends who work with you start to redline and you don't want to destroy that relationship? <laughs> <laughs> so remember I mentioned that gritty, hard to scrabble, ruthless strain in the valley handles this problem. <laughs> So I recruited a, a college chum of mine to be VP of marketing, and we discovered after eight months that he wasn't going to work out. I didn't know how to recruit a VP of I chose the wrong person. But I remember going into the meeting with him and explaining how we had to go. And, and we'd known each other for a very long time. So he got some, he invested some stock. So he made millions of dollars ultimately uh, in the, so I, that made him feel better, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> but halfway through the no, but halfway through the, the meeting, uh, we both realized it was the right thing that we should go. But you know, it was hard to launch the conversation. The, uh, so I, my board asked me to not be CEO uh, and to make Bill my partner CEO. So that was a similar uh, 
red line sort of thing. And it hurt, you know, it was <laughs> uh, so I had wisely created a board that um, knew how to fire people. And the reason, in particular me, because one of the hardest things uh, to have is self-awareness. It is very unlikely that you will discover, that you will realize you're redlined. You'll be redlining and you won't know it. And then someone says, you know, they won't use that word, but they say, you know, you've topped out, we need somebody else in this job now. So that's what the board did for me. The board, I couldn't discover I had redlined. The board had to inform me that I had redlined. They did it twice. Twice they chose somebody else to be CEO. 1981 and in 1990 they chose. So they chose Bill instead of me in 1981, and they chose Eric instead of me in 90. <laughs> a, but uh, by the way, they were right both times. It was the company blossomed both times. So uh, in retrospect, they were right. So perhaps the choosing of the board is so crucial. It was the mistake that Ken Olson made with his board. He, they should have retired him after you know, he became entrepreneur of the century, but they didn't. Mm -hmm. And he hadn't you know, constructed a board whose purpose was to choose the CEO. That's the main purpose of the board, is to choose the CEO. And so his board went along with the gag, gag as he flew his company into the ground. I was saved because I did a great job with Another question, and this will be the last one of the night, so. You mentioned Silicon Valley in the 80s kind of being ripe for innovation and with a lot of cowboys. What are some missteps you think that we can avoid in Austin as we try and uh, grow that innovation within the community here that maybe they didn't, <laughs> they, that, that were, they created the missteps. What do you think we can do to avoid those? Well, there weren't very many missteps in the 80s. It, it all worked out. Uh, um, one mistake we can make, and I'm going to offend people with this, but every once in a while, the mayor or the governor or a senator gets the idea that the government's going to help entrepreneurship. And uh, going to those meetings is dangerous, probably a waste of time. So what you really want them to do is go away. But they don't go away. They feel it's their duty to do something to help entrepreneurship, and it usually backfires. So that's one thing we could do to avoid trouble. Is, of course, Mr. Adler is our new mayor, and he's a great guy. I don't mean to offend him, but you know, he, he's really hot to have lots of meetings to help have the government help us with our entrepreneurship and innovation. I would resist. I would advise resisting the temptation to play that game, for example. There's a bubble. Bubbles occur. They're naturally occurring. There's, it's arguing. We're arguing now whether there's a bubble in innovation now. I think there is. I think it's going to burst really soon. I'm uh, often wrong about that. But the, so bubbles. Another temptation is every time a bubble bursts, everyone wants to go fix it so there can never be a bubble again. <laughs> because that was terrible. A lot of people lost money. We want to be sure there's never a bubble again. And that's a sure way to be sure there's no innovation ever again. The bubble is a tool of innovation. Uh, and to be specific, the uh, internet bubble that burst in 2001 or something, uh, in that silliness, we installed tons of optical fiber. And we've been enjoying that. We enjoyed that optical fiber for another 10 years because it was already buried in the ground. They couldn't dig it up. So, and that was a consequence of this uh, foolishness in the, uh, the internet bubble. That's a way, um, a way in which uh, bubbles are a tool of innovation. They, they create, because the trick is not to be the loser when the bubble bursts, you know, is to have a seat when the music stops. I recommend that. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, in using Bob's own words, we have to be a little bit more gritty, I think. Um, I think he used the words, the valley is a little bit more gritty and a little bit more like Queens than growing flowers, I think you said. So I'd like you to join me in uh, both uh, thanking Bob as UT Professor of Innovation 
using his Silicon Valley terms, uh, the UT professor of uh, innovation equals weed, and perhaps he's the innovation of weed here too. So thank you. <laughs>